I'm so excited to continue this series with all of my Costa Rica content creator friends. And today on the podcast, we have Evan Cudworth, who is the party coach. So stay with me. Hello, everyone. This is Meredith with a Y, and I am your host, Meredith Willett. Today, we are going to go deep, changing lives, and I am giving you the keys to the castle. Evan, thank you so much for being here. You're literally one of my favorite humans, and what you brought to Costa Rica was mind blowing. And I'm so excited for you to share with all my listeners today everything about party coaching and vibe checking and all the things because you literally are a transformative person. So, thank you so much for being here. Meredith, thank you for having me on. Let me just say, when I walked into Costa Rica, uh, this retreat that we did down there. I was checking out everyone's Instagram and TikToks before we get down there. And you, when I looked at yours, I was like a spiritual medium for the Midwest. I was like, we are not going to get along. I was like, this is not going to be my thing. I I do not vibe with this. And I left having had such a transformational experience meeting you, listening to you and your empathy and energy and just what you brought to that experience into my life has been truly special. So I'm really grateful I met you as well. We are literally the luckiest folks in the whole world. I really do believe that. And like when I first learned, like we know, I think that's what we all did, right? We just kind of all poked around on each other's social media. And I remember seeing Party Coach um, prior to Costa Rica. And I was like, oh, this guy like teaches people how to party, like, like, like old school party, right? Like, like as you described growing up being frat guy party, but this is way bigger, way more layers. And so just to start this off, can you tell my listeners what, what your goal is in life and how you got to where you are today? Cause I think this is really huge and really transformative to hear. Amazing. So let's start with two stories. So first of all, I, I'm a raver. I love raving and partying. And in my late twenties, I remember going to a festival in Las Vegas that was sort of an offshoot of like a Burning Man type thing. It was in the desert and some of my favorite DJs and artists were there and it, it rained and it never rains in Vegas. And it completely like washed out all the things we were in our tents and we're like sitting there and I'm like doing drugs in my tent as like the lightning is striking. And I'm like kind of having fun. I stumble out of my tent. I'm kind of black out. And I like help this DJ build a part of his stage. And we're like dancing and like, it should have been a really fun moment, but, but I was so concerned with like, how like how I was trying to control the situation right the rain happened therefore I needed a drink therefore I need more drugs therefore I need these things that like I was not present for the rest of the festival I don't have a lot of good memories from that time right fast forward to um four or five years later and I go to burning the real burning man and during that year I had stopped drinking and I was about eight months of I had done nothing at all And I remember going to sleep at 10 p.m. and waking up at about 4 or 5 a.m. And I walk out of my tent in the desert in Burning Man. And I go out to the same types of DJs that I was hearing at that that festival. I was clean. I was clear. And as I look up in the sky, there's people skydiving into Burning Man, literally like coming out of the sky, flowing down around me. I'm getting chills on my body describing this feeling. But I'm on my bike. And while I I was by myself at that moment, I was so much more connected to people around me because that entire week I had been able to sit and listen and have conversations with people around me. I had been able to go to sleep fulfilled and happy and present and not like trying to have that last two glasses of wine before I went to sleep so that I can get up in the morning and do X, Y, Z. And that week of my life, I come back to, it was one of, it was just one of the best weeks of my life. And I come back to, do I want to skydive into my life and have that feeling of freedom and to do that? Or do I want to be chained to booze and drugs in my tent always and sort of go back and forth? Right. So why I do what I do is because I do, I don't place moral um, emphasis on, on booze or drugs. They have 
provided value, very valuable, fun things in my life and life and other people. And, but if we can create the possibility that you can experience that connection, you can experience freedom, you can experience that tribal connection that we're all searching for. And it's possible to do that without some of these substances that have been marketed to us that say you need these things to be confident. It, if once you find that as a possibility for your life, there's a new freedom and a new connection that people can experience. Yeah. And you and I, you and our group talked a lot about this. So we did like kind of breakout sessions and Evan was in charge of a workshop speaking about this. And I think it cracked, especially me because like you said, you know, I'm in the Midwest, I'm in the suburbs, I'm a mom, you know, what else do we do but drink wine and, you know, hang around and just talk shit. Right. And it really kind of opened me up to the, I know this is going to sound crazy, but even the possibility of not having alcohol around, like that isn't even a thing where I live, like not even remote. Okay. It's like, who's bringing over what kind of wine, you know, blah, blah, blah. Are we doing tequila today or whatever? And being around all of you, not only laid, let me recognize that alcohol is checking out. And I had Lauren on the podcast last uh, week and we were talking about how like shrooms and, and plant medicine and that is more of a checking in. Mm -hmm. And so what you're saying is, this isn't a judgment call. Like you're a bad person for drinking. Like does, this is not a that. This is a, how can we redefine the society that we have been dealt, which is when you're in a group or around people, if you drink, it's more fun. I mean, this goes back to advertising 101, right? With the cigarettes. So this goes back to, you know, when they sell even perfume, if you do this, your life will be more fun. You'll be more connected. You'll be more cool. And so we're kind of talking about reprogramming partying, reprogramming connectedness, reprogramming music festivals instead of being completely out of your freaking skull and, and out of it. You're saying, let's get in it. Let's get, mm -hmm. let's get even more in it. Yes. And I want to be, I, there's two things I would love to talk about today. One, I want to yeah. really unpack like the Midwest and like what I haven't gotten to talk very much about. I grew up in Illinois um, and grew up, yeah, fraternity, Chicago, like every weekend for seven years that I was there. It was like, there was no, there was, there was not a weekend that that's not what I was doing. Right. Yeah. And I don't want to discount and say like, those were fun and I felt connected and I have all those things. And, and these companies wouldn't be marketing something that wasn't in some ways true. Right. There are ways where it, these, these substances give us permission to step outside of things that we're not super comfortable with being ourselves. And we're allowed to step into sort of those bigger things. And people often clients will talk about, Hey, I, like I'm not, I don't have a problem, but I just need those two drinks just to get me going, to get me talking to everyone. I said, great. Okay. Let's unpack that a little bit more, right? What mm -hmm. let's follow through. What are you, what are you afraid of people knowing about you <laughs> that, that you can't get that those two drinks either um, diminish that fear or where does that bring that to you? Right. And this is, it can be scary stuff to talk about, but actually it's the most common thing in the world and everyone is thinking about these things. And even as a party coach, every time I step into a party or a room, I'm still having these feelings. However, what do I do with these feelings? Do I spend $17 on a, a little of, a, of a, on a, a wine glass that's going to tell me, okay, once I do this, I'm going to feel a certain way. And then the next morning I'm sleeping in an extra, I'm hitting snooze for an extra 40 minutes because I can still feel that in my system. Or do I sit with that feeling for a little bit longer? Do I just feel it in my body and in my mind and say, I feel uncomfortable. Maybe this person here, I want to impress this person. And I don't know if they're going to think saying a party coach is stupid, I don't know what they're going to say, right? Sitting in that for a few minutes and instead of, of trying to impress them, coming in saying, hey, how are you, like, what's your vibe today? How are you feeling? What's making you anxious today? 
and create space for them that we can both acknowledge that this is a little bit weird right off the top of the bat. It always is going to be. And in that space, that connection happens without that substance in between. And then after that, perhaps then together, you can go off into that space or you can move into something bigger and better. But those needing those things in that first few minutes, start there and just start to see what feelings come up for you around those types of decisions. You know, what's so interesting as you're talking about this, which I love because it just kind of like, it just peels me back so deep. And I love, I love that so much is it seems very American to um, binge, to be afraid of being vulnerable. Like when, when you're sitting here talking, it's like, I don't want to ever be uncomfortable. Discomfort is the worst thing that could happen to me, right? Like, I don't want to feel vulnerable. Being vulnerable could be the worst thing to ever happen to me. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove that filter, that uptightedness, right? Mm. And so I'm going to push past the discomfort. I'm going to push past into radical, insane vulnerability where I'm just like shitting the bed all over the place. And I don't care what comes out of my mouth. I have zero filter. It just seems like I'm just, as you're talking, I'm thinking about like maybe being in Europe and having a glass of wine and they don't care about talking about sex. They don't care about talking about like, they're not as like uptight in the fear of, I don't know what the it is. It's just like this fear of being uncomfortable seems so American where we just want to take drugs. We want to take, you know, better, faster, stronger, cheaper, right? That's the American way, better, faster, stronger, cheaper. And so the better, faster, stronger, cheaper is let's get shit faced and get past all the discomfort and get straight to, you know, telling everyone your business. It, it's just the better, faster, stronger, cheaper versus take your time, connect, be awkward, um, be vulnerable, have a little discomfort. Maybe it takes a little bit longer, but the connection will be deeper. It's like we can go the better, faster, cheaper, stronger, or we can go the deeply connected, slower version. That's kind of how I'm seeing it as you're talking about it. And I love that. I love that as well. And you reminded me, so I'm past couple of weeks have just been reevaluating. Okay. Like really, why is this, why am I doing what I'm doing? And I've been, I've been doing a lot of research for the last year, but I've really been seeking. I'm curious in the history of how have cultures celebrated or commuted or, or gathered together. And what was the role of perhaps substances or things in these places? And there's a decent amount of scholarship about theology and sort of ceremony around religious rites there's a little bit around even like performance and things like that, but I am having a difficult time finding any sort of comprehensive scholarship on what is the history of party. <laughs> like we know the Greek Greeks and Romans sort of had this, you know, like Saturnalia and there were some crazy things we know, um, you know, uh, what's, what's that thing on uh, Netflix right now? Um, the Shonda Rhimes, Bridgerton, right? Like the, you know, like the, the types of Renaissance parties we'd have. And then of course we know club life, we know roaring twenties, right. But a really close look at why did we do what we did and why, and, and why humans gathered this way and what do we get out of it? So I'm in the very early stages of writing a book on this of why do we party? And one thing that came up for me, and I want to ask you about this is I, from the Midwest, I came from a family that was not a very big drinking family, but we were to get together on like a Saturday at 10 a.m. and like eat and talk all day for 12 hours, right? And it was all about comfort. How can we maximize comfort in every single way, right? So grandma would be making, um, you know, like the big ham and turkey later, but there was snacks all day. And the, it comes from a place of, extreme hospitality and wanting people to feel good. And that is a good place. That's a good intention to come from. Right. Yeah. However, I realized that, you know, like around my family, around those things, we were not able to talk about the hard stuff, right? It was, you were meant to sort of three-dimensional 
think down the road of like, okay, if, if she said this one little thing, I think it means that she was tired, but I have to like, think about it another way. And like, I was trained as a child to like, never directly say what I was feeling or wanted, yeah. but to sort of always indirectly get to that place. And I think that's, there's some cultures, but in the Midwest, that's definitely very strong. Well, so it's very passive more- aggressive. It's yeah. a very passive yes. aggressive place. It's yeah. very smile and be nice to everybody and then talk shit about them behind their back. Like the entire, it's more important in the Midwest to be nice than it is to be kind and honest. And I've yeah. studied, you know, women of color, their focus is to always be, their focus is more so to be honest than to be considered nice. And I actually did a whole podcast on, are you nice or kind? Because I, I find this fascinating in the Midwest that you really don't know where you stand with people because they just want to be perceived as nice to your face, not necessarily honest and kind, you know? So, you know, I I think that that would actually be a really interesting study is to see where on this planet do we not drink? Like, like when we went to India, drinking was not a like people don't just drink, you know what I mean? Like it was like, like what? Like we don't do that. Um, I would f- feel be interested to see where even in our country is drinking less of a focus. I would also look at the financials. Like, do people that are poor tend to drink more to escape daily life? Do people that are rich? drink a lot to stop being so stick up their ass. Like there's reasons everyone's drinking and checking out because that is the the deal, right? Is it five o'clock yet? Do I, what what basically is another term for, do I get to check out yet? Is it time to check out, you know? And so it's definitely this space of leaving reality, entering this kind of alternative vibe. Mm -hmm. And I think that it has become so ingrained in our culture you know, like, like when you do go someplace else in another country, because I don't think that there was really drinking in Bali, even when I went there, like it wasn't really a focus. And so like to look, why are our life? Why are we living our lives on the daily such that it's the misery that we need to check out from? Mm-hmm. And as I'm sitting here thinking about like your generation and younger, what I'm seeing in this moment is that that is exactly what is going on with kids leaving these 40 hour work weeks, nine to five, where it's drudgery. And so, cause they're waking up to the fact of, I hate my job and I can't wait for the weekend. And what people, your generation is turning to is they're like, no, I want to like, every hour. I want to like every day. And so how, how do we stop hating our life so that we can get drunk to escape our life? Like it's, this is what's changing in our world right now. Right. I mean, right. Am I seeing it? So what this, what you just described right now is what I call the party coach moment that I have with clients where people come in usually, and it's, I actually try to talk as little as possible about booze and substances like mm. th- yes they are there and like oftentimes people think like hey maybe i don't want to do it because they, the hangovers are bad or they're feeling like xyz right but ultimately like that's not the problem that i'm solving it's exactly what you're talking about right here which is how do you enjoy yourself and i sometimes use the word full in there how do you enjoy your full self right and part of that issue that comes in here is if and and i'll i'll, I'll use the slur here that alcohol is boomer technology <laughs> of it is something where, you know, when, when, when you had a very structured life and, and where it was that nine to five and it was like, okay, boom, now I get to tune out and become this other person because you have to separate yeah. those, those two parts of your life. And that was the way capitalism set things up to be that actually makes perfect sense and, 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 and works well, but yes. And you had to stay in that job because you had a pension. So no matter how much you hated being a teacher, a iron worker, a construction worker, whatever the, you know, a Ford worker you were putting in those 30 years, no matter what. And I talk about that all the time on this podcast is the difference between the other generation, the boomer generation, even the beginning of probably 
maybe Generation X where you were getting that 30 year job and you were going to stay in it through hell or high water. And it was literally survival. Yeah. You were surviving. Yeah. Uh, but that, and again, this, these are forces way out of my control and, and everything here, but even that person who's going to, uh, like a nine to five job now, what can, how can you enjoy a full self in that? And are there ways that you can set up your life and can we support those people? It is our job to find ways to support people that they can find joy in parts of this job and in their life. And that this separation doesn't have to be so extreme. And we're not giving people a reason to feel shame over what they do. If you are, if you are picking up my trash and driving around in LA, like what a valuable job that is. And usually they're actually paid pretty well, but how can we as a society say, okay, let's, let's support and create infrastructure around these types of people and types, all of these things that it just feel, and again, we're not going to solve all of it, but how can we enjoy our full selves in ways where these barriers don't have to be so extreme. And the only way that we can relate to each other is over shots or over beer. Yeah. I see a big word coming up with regard to, cause it does span the, 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 uh, who has what money, right? It spans completely poor to the very, very wealthy. And when I'm looking at a big, huge word here is shame. Mm-hmm. Like I'm shameful for the shit that I'm doing and I'm really wealthy and I have shame about my life. And then there's the poor person who has shame about their life. And it's all wrapped around this checking out by way of um, this, these feelings of shame, no matter where you sit on the financial ladder. Uh, But I think we are incorporating, I think we we're getting there. I think with the introduction of plant medicine, the introduction of, um, you know, people turning towards like, not finding because because when I was growing up, like, oh, dopes do dope, right? Yeah. Dopes do dope. That's what I was brought up with and dare to keep kids off drugs and all those things. And as we're starting to move towards a little bit more understanding that there are other ways to take part in like hallucinogenics, if you will, plant medicine, marijuana, that alcohol is not the only way. And then as we move forward, you don't even need to check out of life because now you've created a life that you actually want. You're in a marriage that you want to be in or a partnership. We're getting away from, you have to be married. We're getting away from, you have to go to church. We're getting away from, you have to stay in a 30 year career. We're getting away from so many things that I think created this negative shit sandwich lifestyle mentality That people are actually like, wait a minute, I don't have to do any of these things, which then I therefore have to check out of at five Mm o'clock. So me being, I mean, a very, very youthful 49 (laughs) living in the suburbs. And I know when I came back from Costa Rica and even still to this day, I've really cut back on my alcohol because of recognizing like I used to, as soon as it was time to make dinner, and I would literally sometimes start making dinner at 4.30 just so I could crack the wine, like literally, because I'm like, well, I'm making dinner. Like I have an excuse, like, and remind me to tell you my, my funny story. Um, but I have an excuse to, to open this wine. Ever since Costa Rica, I stopped drinking while making dinner. And now instead I try to drink a ton of water and then I'm not even hungry for dinner too. P.S. Yeah. Well, by the way, you are like glowing as I'm looking at you on Zoom right now, even in your closet. You are just, I, I can see. I'm in the closet. I, yeah, I yeah, literally yeah. am in the closet. Yeah. Well, you're, you're sweet. Glowing. Yeah. So, so, so like I, I, so now I'm ingesting tons of water, whereas I used to put away probably two and a half glasses of wine, which is nothing but empty calories, nothing but sugar. And now I'm getting ready to eat. So now I'm going to be even like more like stupid, not using my you know, prefrontal cortex when making food decisions, right? So now I'm filled with water. I'm super hydrated. I'm not going to be looking to food for hydration. I'm going to be really within my own brain while I'm eating. Even if I have a glass of wine with dinner, I haven't put away a half a bottle of wine while making dinner. And I'm going to tell you the reason I'm talking about this is this is a huge thing in suburbia is drinking while making dinner. I'm telling you, this is 
a crutch you cannot imagine so many people use. And so that was a huge game changer for me is recognizing that also talking to people about when I don't drink, how well I sleep, because this is another thing. As you get older, that liver wakes you up at one o'clock with some night sweats. And then it hits you at three o'clock with having to go to the bathroom. The days that I have absolutely zero alcohol, I am asleep at 1030 and I am awake at 6 a.m. I've slept through the whole night. I'm not up with night sweats. I'm not up going to the bathroom. I'm not up tossing and turning because my brain is trying to process all that freaking ass alcohol. The, 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 the quality of life and this I'm I promise you I will have a drink this week. I promise this, this is not anti-drinking. It's just check in with the fact that drinking a bottle of wine a night is not freaking normal. It's not. Yeah. Um, an apology to I have my the sanitation workers are outside my <laughs> right now. So I can't pull. hear it. You're fine. Perfect. Um, well, may, well, first of all, congrats. And like bringing that awareness to your life is so awesome and amazing. Um, where does, where did shame maybe play into that before and where does it play in now and how, and because what I don't want it to get into right now where I see people get frustrated or fail with this is when you begin shaming yourself about like, Oh, I'm so bad. I was so whatever it was. The bad, but, right. The judgment. Yeah. So how does shame play into some of those decisions for you? Well, for me, for me, there's, there's never shame involved. And for me, I, I have turned this all to the word self-care. Love it. So it's about like, I'm taking care of myself today in this way. But if I have a glass of wine, I'm not bad. If I, if I don't, I'm not good. None of it. There's, there's literally zero judgment about it. It's just like, it, it's weird. It's like, um, I'm going to have a salad because I really want it. And I'm going to get, you know, salmon on the side because I really want it. I have actually removed the shame entirely, but there was also a lot of shame involved in like when I, when we were getting ready to go to Costa Rica and I saw that we were going to be doing plant medicine, I'm like, Oh, I'm not doing that. Oh my God. I'm not doing that. Like I am. That is not who I am. And yeah. then I go to put, I'm like dropping acid. I'm doing the shrooms. I'm doing peyote. I'm doing, you know, c- cacao. I'm doing all the things. And I was like, wait a minute. This is a societal story that I'm telling myself that these things are bad, that marijuana I've grown up my entire life for 40, you know, let's see, I, I probably started doing gummies like a year ago, a year and a half ago. So for 48 years, 47 and a half years telling myself that if you have anything to do with marijuana, you're a, like the, the noise of shame almost throws you into this catapult forward of self-hate. I don't fucking hate myself anymore. Yeah. How about that? How about I just don't fucking hate my life? I don't hate myself. I'm not running around using society's judgment of me. If I want a glass of wine, I'm going to have it. If I want to, you know, have a gummy, I'm going to have it. If I want to do mushrooms, I'm going to do it. And none of it is shameful. I don't hate myself. And so I love myself so much that I want to drink the water while I'm making dinner because I know it's going to make my skin 10 out of 10. I know it's going to like make me feel 10 out of 10. I'm going to sleep 10 out of 10. It literally soup to nuts is self-care, but I would have never even seen what I was doing to myself without the fucking conversation in Costa Rica to go, eh, what yeah. do you, eh, there's another way because you yeah. don't know there's another way because you're so inside of the way. Yes. What the fuck? It's, it's beautiful how it happens. Uh, and you know, one of the things I talk about is like wellness that works for your weekend, right? Because I think a hurdle for a lot of people here and why they don't take these steps is because oftentimes, even if, even if it's the one, like if you, so you, you were talking about like when you go back into these dinner parties and things of like not drinking, not being in that space, there's a fear that people won't like me anymore. Oh, I'm going to be separated from my friends. Oh, like if you're not in that in group that, that, and in some ways that's wellness, right? Like we need to feel connected. We need to have those things. Right. But 
can we incorporate wellness that doesn't focus so much on the consumption, right? What are you taking away? But what are you creating? And I heard, I just heard for you, you are creating genuine self-love. You are creating self-care that isn't about checking out and, and saying like, oh, like I, do, I don't like my skin, so I'm going to drink. And therefore, like the shame goes away, but saying right. holistically, OK, like what am I actually moving towards this? And still, if you want to, you know, after feeling those good emotions, then can indulge in some of these types of things, that that is a healthier path along that road. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love it. However, you know, the, and again, for anyone listening to this too, like shame can be a powerful uh, motivator for change, but it is, it's not a, you know, it's one of the lowest vibrational things we can experience. And yeah. if you grew up in the Midwest or you grew up in a place that said comfort is, comfort is self-care. And this is what's going to connect to you to people like that. Is, this is what you've been taught. Come to terms with that and say, okay, great. I've experienced that. Maybe this, maybe I've experienced as much of that as I have in my, in this life that I get to experience. And now I'm going to try something else. And it's possible for me to not give this up forever, yeah. but think about what happens when you take it and you set that down, you have an open hand, right? With that open hand, you can shake somebody's news. You can go and try yoga. You can go and, you know, create something. I talk about consumption versus creator right? And how do you move from a consumer? Are you consuming the vibes around you? Do you have to consume something to feel it? Or are you creating, are you generating the vibes and connections around you? Right. Yeah. And just start to think about that. What percentage of the time are you feel, are you enjoying yourself because you're consuming versus creating? And if you can start to even out that equation, come back, tell me how that feels in two weeks. And I guarantee you're going to feel something pretty special. Well, and I just like, so, so we all, all of us in Costa Rica, we did this ecstatic dance. Mm -hmm. And so normally if I were going to go to a dance, it would be like, have a couple drinks, get loosened up, think about what I look like what I look like physically, what I look like dancing physically, who's in the room, what do they look like physically? Um, who do I want to connect with? And for what reason um, do, you know, everything would be about very much self-aware of the way I look. And when you go to the aesthetic dance, you know, for the most part, you're sober, like at least sober from alcohol, like someone might do some sort of plant medicine, but we were so, I, I think we were sober. I, I remember we were right. And no one's allowed to talk to you and no one's allowed to touch you. Mm -hmm. And these were such foreign concepts for me anyways. And when I watched you doing the aesthetic dance, so basically it's like you have this yoga instructor who's kind of like kind of leading the dance, if you will, you're kind of like just moving to the music. It's, it's check it out in your area. Look up aesthetic dance. It's, it's, it's very life-changing. It's very jarring, especially to someone like myself. It's very jarring to be doing something only for the sake of doing it for yourself. <laughs> very bizarre, like very transformative. So when I was watching you, dance and also um walter it was it was really cool to be a part of seeing somebody doing something for themselves only for the sake of self but i also saw you being a leader in that moment too like you tend to have this leadership role when you're around people and it's like you want them to catch the vibe. Mm -hmm. Like, that's how I see you. You're like, and even if, like when I follow you on social media. So if everyone needs to go follow um, Evan underscore Cudworth, it's all going to be in the show notes. But like when I watch you on social media, it's this very leadership role of energy. Like you can have this too. 
and even like when I'm watching you working out, like on your, um, on your Instagram, which everyone you have to go, his body is stupid. Good. I mean, his body is like, there's, there's muscles on top of muscles on top of muscles and so much strength. And you should see the shit that he can do. It's just mind blowing, but it makes you want to be a better person. I don't know how else to describe it. Like it makes, it makes it makes someone understand possibility. There's a possibility to have a good life without being drunk all the time. There's a possibility to have fun without getting shit faced. I guess that's the best way to describe kind of being around you and, and, and following you on social media. It's a reminder of this energy that does live inside of all of us that just has to be have a catalyst, which is you. And I mean, you do one-on-one coaching with us. So like you would literally sit down with someone like me. So if you're out there and you're trying to figure out how in the Sam hell do I figure out why I'm drinking, figure out why I'm drinking so much, figure out how do I change what I'm drinking? How do I go to a party and not get shit faced? Like, this is what I'm trying to explain. Like he really, I mean, we're what four months out of Costa Rica now, I think. And, and it's still a part of who I am that I'm aware of my habits. I'm aware of uh, my brain and how my brain saw drinking and sees drinking and incorporates drinking. Like, this is what he does. He kind of turns the dial and you do this by way of coaching, but you also have this vibe check community that you have now created. So can you tell us about that? For sure. Well, first of all, like it's so cool to just hear how these things resonate and I can see uh, it's been really fun to watch you explore on social media and moving to areas of discomfort for yourself as well. I know you've been exploring, um, you know, all kinds of stuff, whether it's race or, or, or gender and all those and sexuality and those types of things too. And going to those uncomfortable places and stepping outside of our Midwestern niceties has been really fun to watch for you. Yeah. And that's still something that's scary to me. However, for one reason or another, I was imbued with this, like, I'm, I'm happy to air all of my laundry about like, drugs and all, all this kind of stuff. It's easier for me to talk about this. I, I don't know why, but for a lot of other people, it's very shameful for me. Yeah. It's not, but if this is shameful for you, or even if it's not a couple things we can do, right. If you want to just have a co- conversation with me, I can do a little 15 minute, just one-on-one. And I just call this like a vibe check party coach conversation. Just come and tell me what's working. It's not, what's not working for you. From there, we can figure out some people really respond well. And I honestly believe group coaching is the best way that you're going to get the fastest, best results because it's not about self-awareness, right? Like I can, if you want to do one-on-one work, we can unpack your purpose and can do that type of work. It's going to take longer, but we can get to that work. What happens when you start to see other people moving through this? And maybe you saw this. I So when I was at that ecstatic dance, we all set some... Um, sort of light intentions for how we wanted to feel and simply hearing other people say like, Hey, I feel uncomfortable in my body or I feel these things there. I can see everyone's eyes being like, Oh wow. Other people think that as well. And as soon as you start to see other people moving through these emotions and ideas, your growth goes five, six X times faster. Right. I understand that not everyone's going to be comfortable with that right off the bat, but this is a group of people that are safe. It's comfortable. You know, we're going to work through some of these things together. Every morning we start, we write just gratitudes in a discord channel and just start the day with a little bit of gratitude. Right. Um, We'll come together on two to three. We call them vibe checks each week where people come together and we say one through 10, how are we feeling (laughs) and what's working and not working in our lives. And then around that, start to plan and set some intentions. So if you're going to a um, a wedding this weekend, right? And you're like, oh, you know, like I'm going to this wedding, but like it's, you know, I'm the girlfriend of like, my, it's my boyfriend's family. Like I'm really uncomfortable being around them. We'll walk through and I will coach you through, okay, here, ha, here's a couple different ways this could go. Yeah. How do you want to feel? And what can we do to, to have you feel connected, feel whatever it is you want to feel on that. And you have a group, not only me as a coach, but you have a game plan, you have an idea and you have support for how you want to feel in those areas. And you're not going to be perfect every single time, but 
I'd argue that how you feel and the purpose of, of why we are on this planet and exist as humans is to explore the full spectrum of human experience. And if you are committed to always dulling your experience because you're afraid of the, your, your mother-in-law who's like wants everything to be perfect all the time, you are missing out on the full spectrum of human experiences and you will die with regrets. Yeah. <laughs> and I do not want you to die with regrets. The reason I do what I do is I read an article about three or four years ago that was a hospice nurse who let with the top five regrets of people that have in their lives. None of them were... I wish I earned more money and I wish I spent more time at work. They were all about, I wish I would have spoken up and told people I love them more. I wish I would have connected and like stopped thinking about whatever people were thinking and, and to, to take care of myself. Right. These types of things are what people regret on their deathbeds. Connection. And people laugh at party coach and they laugh at this idea of, Oh, you know, like what do you, what, you know, who needs this? Who would pay for this? Listen, I will do this for free, but I pay, you're going to pay me for it. But right. I truly believe that the, we are this, these spiritual beings that are having this human experience. Once we can get out of that flesh and mind and all of these things that we've been conditioned that say that has to be this certain way, that it is possible for you to be free, to feel connected, to enjoy yourself without anxiety, without substances, that is possible for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not as hard as you think. It mostly is just letting go of things. It's not, um, you know, it's not, you don't have to go to the gym seven days a week. <laughs> you can, you can find something that works for you. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a practice that just takes a little bit of that vulnerability. And you, you will coach with someone like say they're going to have a, a party and they do or don't want alcohol included. You can help curate literally the vibe of an entire party of how it's going to feel. Maybe, maybe we don't serve alcohol right out of the gates. Maybe you curate an experience first in the backyard and then, oh yeah, we're going to have drinks, but they're going to be served at dinner or like whatever the thing is, you can work with people and curate an entire party with them. And if they want to, so if anyone wants to get in touch with you, the best way to do it is by way of messenger on like um, TikTok, which is at Evan underscore Cudworth or Instagram, same at Evan underscore Cudworth. Again, show notes for TikTok or um, Instagram. So if someone wants to hire you either for one-on-one coaching or to get more information on the Vibe Tech community or to hire you to, because like when you talk about the vibe check, I mean, a vibe is everything from music, decorations, games, food, uh, activities, the way you, you dress. I saw you went to a white party recently, you know, Um, maybe it's going to have sparklers involved and that's going to change the vibe and up the game. You know, a lot of times too, people I think are lazy and they know if they crack a bottle of wine and put out some cheese party check, is box checked, right? Where you're saying, well, let's add a little bit more into it. So we're not leaning heavy on the alcohol. We can leave heavy, heavy on the vibe and the fun. And I think that a lot of people like start, you could start there. I think two things that are huge to start with Evan would be to figure out like, how can you switch up your drinking game? If you are drinking five, six, seven nights a week or days, how do you go to a party setting intentions of what's the intention of the party? How do I want to leave the party? How do I want to wake up the next morning? Cause you taught that to us in uh, Costa Rica, which I thought was a game changer. So working with him about really being intentional about the way you experience fun. And then a third way is getting with him to how to create an actual vibe fun experience that isn't lazy on just getting shit face and throwing out, like I said, a charcuterie board and calling it a day. Like there's a lot more that can go into and your party will actually be memorable <laughs> instead of forgettable. <laughs> yes. And and that's the big thing that I, that I think about is think back on memorable experiences you've had and don't just cut like I've had some super memorable, like go crazy blackout party nights, right? Like those can be really fun, right? But very often what I started to notice was the more fun that I was having was 
because I got a little vulnerable and I asked that question to a friend at a dinner party, or we stayed afterwards and actually were in that conversation, or I left a party early because I was feeling crappy and I went home and I watched Lord of the Rings. And like, I had a better night and I felt better the next morning because I didn't feel like I needed to please the people there, right? All of those are possibilities for you. Um, But it starts with just checking your own vibe. What feels good? Forgive. I talk about forgive the why, right? Why you're drinking, why you're doing these things, forgive it. You can forget it for right now. You can deal with that later. Deal with it in therapy, right? (laughs) Start to feel how you want to feel and take action and don't spend too much time in the figuring out the why. It sounds so stupid, but one of the biggest reasons that I like not drinking is sleeping. It's great. I mean, it sounds so dumb, but like being able to wake up in the morning and go, holy shit, I wasn't up three times last night is an absolute game changer for your clarity, for your body, just for feeling like mentally good. For me, that is a 100% reason not to drink a bottle of wine at night. I'll plug another, I don't know if you've heard of the Huberman Lab podcast Mm -hmm. at all. Um, He's a Stanford, um, sort of runs this lab, but it's all about taking, he talks a lot about how like the scientific community and the spiritual mystical communities I both discovered these things, right? Whether it's how to sleep, you know, getting light in your eyes in the morning, right? All these sorts of things. But both of us use such jargony language and and keep it so far away from people that we sort of hide it. So he brings those ideas together and sort of just talks very plainly around like, but it comes from more of the scientific side of things, but it's just like, this is what these studies say. And he has a great podcast on sleep. And maybe I can send this to you, you can put in the show notes, but alcohol and like even a sip like before we go to bed f's with your sleep schedule it's one of the worst things you could do for sleep so even though we think like that wine is helping you get to bed you're not getting rest you're not getting rem sleep it's not helping you it's science is proven this as a fact 100 so you know finding ways to to if you need the rationalization for it from science go find it but like Stop drinking to get to sleep and you're going to feel better. <laughs> and it's it's really going to, to improve all aspects of your life. I love it. Well, thank you so much for being here today. I hope everyone goes and checks everything out that you're doing. He has such great stuff on Instagram and TikTok, like great little nuggets, great little nudges, lots of energy, lots of, you know, videos and sh- with his shirt off. So like, don't, don't not go because I mean, I'm telling you, it's worth, it's worth the price of admission. Um, he's a beautiful human. You're a beautiful human. I'm just so excited that you could be here and spend this time with me and share your information to everybody. I think what you're doing is literally cutting edge. It's going to be the way of the future as people get happier in their life and do try to figure out how to incorporate all of these new things and not sure how to do it or why they want to do it and why they don't want to drink as much. And where is this coming from? They're going to need a leader. And in my opinion, you're that guy. So thank you so much for being here today. Everyone go check him out. If you need help, you know, let him know and he can figure it out. Join his community. I think it's going to be a great change for this new new next portion of our lives. Really, I do. Amazing, Meredith. Thank you for having me on. I am the party coach. You can supply your own high. Everyone is doing it. (laughs) Let's send this vibe check to the world. Thank you, Mayor. I love it. See you guys next week. Thanks for listening. If you would like to connect on a more personal level, head over to MeredithWillits.com or on Instagram at Meredith with a Y for behind the scene footage and outtakes. Please subscribe and come back each week for more Meredith with a Y. Thanks again for listening. Cheers.